That's what death is, isn't it? Forgetting, being forgotten. I always pictured myself dying in my own bed, at the age of 80, with a belly full of wine and a girl's, girl's mouth, mouth around my cock. Hi everybody, hello, no ga. Welcome to another Q&A video and let's get right to it. Game, talking about Game of Thrones season eight, episode two, Stephen Byrne, long time viewer. He says, why do I cry so much during this show? Mm. Mm. You know, the more I grow up, mm -hmm. the more I cry while I watch stuff. Mm -hmm. Me too. You too? It's interesting to know why he's crying. I mean, but it could also be from the fact that we're about to separate from the show. Like the ending is near. Yeah. Yes, yes. Another comment from Philip, dear patron. So we talked a bunch of times this season about the similarities between what is happening now in the season and World War II. Mm -hmm. Either uh, uh, rival forces working together to fight one common enemy, knowing that in the day after there will be a split, right? Like uh, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And also having like a wartime leader, like John, Churchill John. Philip thinks that Daenerys is a little bit, he's, she's the Stalin here. Uh, because she's an idealist. And he was an idealist, a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. mm, that you'll have to face sooner or later. And her revolution, right, liberation, liberation of slaves, was very idealistic. But now she's in Westeros. And she doesn't leave a lot of room for doubt. Mm -hmm. While uh, Tyrion, her advisor, and Sansa, they are more pragmatic than her. I mean, we do see a different side of Danny. I mean, even in this episode, her conversation with Sansa. Now I'm here, half a world away, fighting Jon's war alongside him. Tell me who manipulated whom. She can change her mind. She can be a bit more flexible than what it seemed at the beginning. And I think that she has changed her mind several times in the show. I mean, also, right. yeah, so... Yeah, reopening the pit, the fighting pits. Right, reopening the fighting pits, uh, deciding to stay and rule instead of uh, moving right. on to conquer. So she, she is a pragmatist in a way. Like, she does try to do, like, the, the pragmatic, pragmatic things. She's not purely ideological in that sense. But uh, she's not pragmatic in the fact that she should be on top. So when John tells her, ah, mm -hmm. by the way, I'm the king, she's like, nah, uh, uh, yeah. this is mine. Uh, not yet. I mean, we, we're not quite sure yet. I mean, it took her by surprise, of course, and there was no time to discuss it. And uh, just saying just something... Just had like an hour of, of, of episode <laughs> time. <laughs> right. But immediately the White Walkers came. I mean, you know. Yeah. Okay, we'll see uh, next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll see next time because uh, I can really, I mean... Yeah, I can relate to the fact that he's just, you know, he's saying something and then uh, you can't just say something because it means so much, you know. Right. You can't just say, oh, yeah, this is the story. No, right. there, are, there are pragmatic uh, outcomes to that also. Right, and also she's uh, right uh, to ask, uh, how do we know that this is true? Right, of course, yeah, your best friend and your brother right. say, say something, I mean, okay, you know. But she didn't say that she was angry about the fact that now he might be ahead of her in line. She wasn't like, what the fuck, so are we related? That didn't cross her mind uh, at yeah. that point. But also, I mean, the fact that, <laughs> sorry, you want to move on, but, yes. but also, yeah, the fact that uh, he didn't say, uh, oh, I have something to tell you. He didn't prepare her for it. Right. He avoided her the he entire episode. He avoided her the entire episode. And then when they were standing, I mean, she was just, you know, trying to, you know, get close to him, uh, have some uh, yeah. quality you, time with him. Are you mad at me? Yeah, exactly. She was trying to, you know, sniff uh, out what was happening. Mm. And then he started telling her that story and suddenly he landed that kind of uh, revelation on her. Okay, so K.O. smiles. I couldn't watch... This is about our video. Hi everybody, hello Noga, how are you doing? Happy to see you. It's great to have you as always. No, it's okay. I couldn't watch past, past the first five seconds. Why is he being such a to Noga, who is obviously smarter, kinder, 
and more interesting than he is. Does he think he's funny? The last video I tried to watch was the same. I hope that if she is truly choosing to put up with this, with this boneheads attitude, that he's at least paying her well, unsubbed. What do you have to say to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So, first of all, I have a tendency uh, to get excited and to cut people off. Mostly people comment when I do it to female collaborators. Nobody ever said anything when I cut off Itamar. It's very Israeli, by the way, very to do Israeli. that. Yeah, very Israeli, yeah. Yeah, but you don't cut people off. No. And the moment that I start to speak, you stop speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not very Israeli in that sense. Mm. Other ways, yes. Omri Goldstrom. It's related to the, to the previous comment that I read. Long-time patron. Gil, maybe you can ask Noga to psychoanalyze why you choose self-deprecating viewer comments. Why do I read... I like to read self-deprecating uh, viewer comments. Why is that, Noga? Please tell me. I want to understand. Oh, wow. Why do you think that is? <laughs> I like self-deprecating humor. First of all, I think mm -hmm. it's disarming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps people uh, connect with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe I hate myself inside. Why? Why do you hate yourself <laughs> inside, Gil? Oh. Devil may cry. This is about <laughs> our, <laughs> our uh, video about uh, radical feminism in, uh, in the show. I was uh, saying that, uh, right, so for a man, that wouldn't happen because he doesn't uh, carry uh, the baby in his womb. His womb serves no purpose. It's just, uh, it's just there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As far as I know. Like his nipples. <laughs> what purpose did they serve? Who knows? <laughs> So Devil May Cry says, a man doesn't have a womb, you retard. Learn science. You feminists are never happy. He actually thinks I was serious. Uh, mm, yeah, mm. All I wasn't of, serious. No, I was not. All of the men on the show are either dead, neutered, or dumbed down, or bent the knee, and you're still not happy. Effing fucking sickening. Always something to complain about, says as he's complaining. Kim Cortade, another longtime patron. According to Brand, the Night King wants to kill him because he represents man's memory. Mm -hmm. She likes that explanation and the possible discussion of if you don't remember it, did it really happen? Actually, we, we were talking about uh, doing a video or a podcast about memory, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But Kim is having a hard time believing that this is why the Night King wants to kill him, considering that no one is aware of the Three-Eyed Raven's existence. What do you think? I don't know, I felt that this was uh, lazy. Just like, boop, putting it in. Ah, by the way, the reason that the White Walkers are here is just to erase man's memory, so they're just like super evil zombies, monsters with, no, with nothing interesting. Uh, no right. Like, they, their only motivation is to harm others, not to benefit themselves. I mean, uh, usually, I mean, that's a very paranoid way to look at things, right? Someone is doing something because they want to do harm to me, not because they might have their own, you know, as different subjects or... So, but... Uh, and this is, does not really fit this story, I think. Yeah, it doesn't really fit this story because, uh, as we said in the past, we do believe that uh, George R. R. Martin... He has this kind of, uh, he doesn't have that clear separation between good and evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe the White Walkers are this and that. And of course, we'll see that in the show to come. In the prequel. In the prequel, yeah. But, um, but yeah, it does seem a bit simplistic. And I think she's right in the fact that uh, it's not as if, I mean... It, and it it's came out of left field, like, why, like nobody ever talked about that before. So just like, ah, it's about memory, racing memory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. But also, uh, it's not quite clear what is the role of the Three-Eyed Raven in the sense, I mean, we know the Citadel, it holds the knowledge, okay, so the Three-Eyed Raven uh, holds the memory, or we talked about it like the realms, like the, the pre-conscious of the realm. But in the Citadel, at least, you can turn to them to ask for that knowledge. I mean, that knowledge is kept somewhere, and then you turn to them and you ask for it. 
with the three-eyed raven, no one knows that he exists, like you said. Okay, he lives in those trees. Those trees, they have this kind of, I mean, I mean, it's interesting to see how people can gain access to that knowledge and what will happen if the three-eyed raven disappears. I mean, you know, the history is written somewhere in the citadel. Right. I mean, it's unclear in that it's sense, unclear. and then it becomes a bit uh, redundant. Maybe I'm overanalyzing it, but in some of the comments from uh, patrons that, that, that like the episode, uh, maybe I can read between the lines some other stuff. For example, Brandon Pollard, boom. I thought this episode was fine. And then he goes on to say all kinds of stuff that were not fine. Mm. Arian Gendry, me. You know, I was surprised that Theon was able to get from King's Landing uh, faster than Tormund and Co could get from uh, Last Hearth. Mm. Mm. He was surprised that we didn't have any King's Landing scenes mm. and didn't have any action uh, sequences. I'm, I'm not really bothered by it either, but I'm surprised. Maybe I feel like we are so invested in, in this story that maybe we have a little bit sometimes of a hard time accepting when it fails us. Brian C. Morris, this episode was great in my opinion. They took the time to let the stories develop. And then, I'm not sure where, where this Theon Sansa thing is coming from, but I guess they spent time together with Ramsay. When you have to guess the character development and the character connections, for me it, say, it, it says that, that the story is lacking. Mm -hmm. And you know what was for me the most annoying part? Of this uh, of this episode, when they had to go there for me personally, it felt like a fuck you to the fans. Yeah. So they wrote off uh, Ghost uh, in season six without telling everybody, and now it, he's just there for a second. I feel maybe they're like trying to be Avengers style, Marvel style. Oh, I'm sorry. I I didn't know how this machine worked. Self humor mm -hmm. and self references. But the source material is not the same. The comic books in, with Marvel, it works. You can, you can take it lightly and still enjoy it. Then you have seen Ragnarok, the fall of Asgard, the great prophecy. Now, hang on, hang on. I'll be back around shortly. Do I really feel like we were connecting there? Here, the source material, material is serious, mm -hmm. it's deep. Mm -hmm. It, it feels cheap in that way. And bury my sword deep in Asgard. Oh, hang on. Give it a second. I swear, I'm not even moving. It's just doing this all the time. This is my crown. The source of my power. Oh, that's a crown. I thought it was a big eyebrow. Last but not least, Nick Mean from Facebook. Boom. After waiting eight years to see this battle, mm -hmm. how does it feel to wait one more week? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, it's not, I'm not, uh, the big battle is not what I was like pining for and looking for necessarily. I don't mind waiting another week. Mm -hmm. I just would have liked to have in this episode less playing the like greatest hits. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember this joke. Oh, remember what happened? We remember what happened before? No, it was just uh, like rehashing all stuff that happened before. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, there were some character developments there. The parallels between us waiting and them waiting and us waiting, you know, like the long, we waited for the show for so long and, you know, so, and, and it does feel like what you said before, like about the Marvel thing and the self-humor and, you know, like the wink to the viewer, it does seem like the show is more communicating with the viewer, not necessarily in a good way. I mean, it depends, of course, on how you view it, but... Mm. There's a lot of communication with the viewers, talking about the past, Jamie and Tyrion. Oh, it was much better then, right? Being nostalgic about the past, like viewers are being nostalgic about previous seasons. Right. So is it self-betterment, really? It's, it's interesting to see, you know, these kinds of like dialogues with the viewer, this kind of communication, the parallels mm -hmm. between the things. I would prefer communicating to us via story. Really, yeah. yeah. But that's me, that's me. I don't mind waiting another week. When you're watching this, it's, re it's less than a week. I don't mind waiting for the big battle. I, I hope that it won't be just like super G CGI and worrying stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
Thank you everybody for watching. I want to thank all our new patrons and invite you to join in for just one cup of coffee. Keep help us keep this thing going about all kinds of stories from all kinds of topics and angles. We're going to do the psychology and we're going to do psychology in movies, right? Right. Boom. So just one cup of coffee and also thank all the patrons who bumped up their pledges to help us keep going. So thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you all next time. Bye everybody. Bye. So I wanted to let you know about the Thrones effect. How Game of Thrones conquered pop culture. This is the definitive book about the Game of Thrones phenomenon. It's a collaborative book with seven other YouTubers and two other God Academy collaborators and we take a bird's eye view about what Game of Thrones means from all kinds of angles and what has made it so successful. Is it the psychoanalytical angle, the way that we empathize with the characters? Is it the historical political angle? Is it so good because of the inspirations that preceded A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones? Is it the fact that it allows us to escape to a different world from all our trials and tribulations? Is it that it allows us to connect to other like-minded people from all over the world? Is it the characters that we can interpret so differently? Is it the fact that it deconstructs fantasy and creates a whole new genre? All of this and more is discussed in the Thrones Effect. So if you want to get the ebook version, boom, the link is in the description. The audiobook and print edition hard copy coming soon. It's a very enjoyable read. Each chapter takes you to a whole different point of view. Each chapter has its own point of view, reminds you of something? Boom, it's below in the description. Enjoy.